This video is a little different. It features a challenging mending project that I did last year for my friend and teacher, Dr. Tom Garcia. You'll hear more about Tom and his life-changing work later. But first, I'll mend his poncho. And I'll do that with some help from one of the brightest lights in the costuming community, whom you'll meet in the next few minutes. It is December the 22nd, I'm on holiday, so of course I'm sewing still. This is a mending project. Something very unusual, unlike anything I usually do. This is a poncho that belongs to a very dear friend of mine. And it has a couple of problems and needs a mend. Now, my friend Tom works outdoors and he has some equipment that he takes with him up to the site where he works, but there's some kit that stays there that lives up there in big plastic bins under a tarpaulin. And one of the things that has been up there is this poncho. And you would think that in plastic bins with a tarpaulin over it, it would be safe. But unfortunately, the rats are very intelligent and they like to munch on things. So this poncho has sustained some damage and he discovered this last time I was up there with him and it's you know it's clearly special to him and he thought it was just ruined and couldn't be fixed so of course you know historical dressmaker over here gets on a soapbox and I said to him well repairs and darns and mends are part of the story of a garment it can add to it it doesn't necessarily take away from it and this can be fixed, these can be fixed. You know, this is what darning and mending and patching are for. The next thing I knew, I had a project. <laughs> so he asked me to fix it for him. So I brought it back to England. He trusted me with it. And now I'm standing here thinking, okay, how are we going to fix this? Because really some of these holes are rather big, a bit big for darning. First rule for darning. Never wait for a hole. We're gonna need patching, I think. I mean, my first thought was, well, you add to the story of the garment. I could do something cool with. Clearly, I haven't got a beautiful hand-woven wool lying around in exactly this color, but this is where you make the mending a part of the garment and you make it a feature. And the closest thing I have is this red wool, which is not a great match, but you know, you add to the story of it, don't you? And then I looked again, and I don't think this is the solution. I'm getting a little bit further in over my head than I realised. No, no, I'm sure nobody who's watching this has ever done that before, because I started to look up what a poncho is. I mean, we think of it as a very humble sort of garment. It's just a piece of fabric with a hole in the middle that you throw over your head as an outerwear garment. And, it, you know, you find them in all sorts of places all over the world. But really, when I started looking it up, I remember Tom saying that this came from Peru. And it turns out that a poncho is an important part of South American indigenous culture. Here's Aran Zucchelli to tell us a little more. Hi, my name is Aidan Zucchelli. I am a designer, consultant, and researcher of ethnic garments. Kathy asked me to take a look at this poncho, and this is what I have to share with you. The poncho is a Mayo outwear garment, traditional of many Native American peoples. In the US, it's mostly associated to Southwestern wear and Mexican wear, but it's present in many other countries throughout the Latin America, including Brazil. The name can vary from culture to culture. Sometimes it's known as Gabon, like in Mexico, or Palo de Gaúcho, like in Brazil. It is a comfy, versatile, sleeveless article of clothing. It is impossible for me to attest for sure where this is from without further investigation. However, it does look very similar to the ones of the Aymaras and Quechua people. Originally from Peru, these people exist in other countries like Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador. 
These people express part of their identities through the weaving of textiles. And like typical Highlanders, the way that they weave the fibers, the amount of stripes and the colors make it possible for us to identify who they are as individuals. And that sense is very similar to Scottish tartan because we can see the amount of stripes and what are the colors and then identify in what group this individual belong to. If it's a clan, a sub-clan. Just looking at the color and the pattern, a trained eye can tell where the individual that is wearing it's from. Also, in a similar way, the plaid of the kilt comes from the Gaelic word plaid, that means blanket. And similarly, in Mapuche, in Araucanian language, from Chile, the word for poncho, ponto, it means woolen fabric that can be translated as blanket as well. How would they wear this poncho? Rebecca Church said that the stereotype is that men typically wear loose slacks, sandals, and then the loose poncho top over a button-down shirt, and that is topped with a wide brimmed hat. And again, patterns will vary greatly from one ethnic group to another. And the women that weaves it may add a little touch of her personality, kind of like a signature of her weaving. So within a community, we can identify stripes and patterns. They are typical to the entire group, but we can also identify that signature of that one weaver. However, what we understand today as traditional wear is actually an evolution of 16th century Spanish peasant wear, according to Blenda Femenius, and Peruvian costume and European perceptions in the 18th century dress. This is the time period that I research and I am a little bit obsessed with this. This theme is just so, so rich and I could talk about it for hours, but I won't <laughs> because we don't have time for this. But how about we do another one next time? <laughs> we'll hear more from Aran later. You know, a poncho is not just a poncho, however simple it is as a garment. It's actually two pieces of handwoven wool seamed together along the top here. It's not so much that a hole has been cut in it, but a gap has been left in the seam across the top and it's been bound all the way around the edges. But this is, this is part of somebody else's culture, so I'm not going to just come in with my cutesy European mending techniques and just try to put a cute patch on it. You know, I need to be a bit more sensitive to where this comes from and do this as invisibly as possible, you know, retaining the character of the garment. So now I'm sitting here going, what would they do on the repair shop? Which is my favourite, well, the only TV show I watch, really. What we are really looking at here is that I just signed up for a reweaving project, which is a very intricate, invisible mending technique. And I think that's the best I can do to mend this piece, retaining the integrity of the garment and not imposing anything of me on it other than to enable it to be what it already is. Usually the technique of reweaving involves taking the binding off here and pulling individual threads off the very edge of the fabric and using them to literally weave the fabric back together, weaving them into each side of the hole. So you'd literally kind of recreate the fabric. And I don't know whether that's going to be doable with that bigger hole. Usually in this case, you take a piece of fabric to use as a patch and you reweave the edges of it in rather than reweaving over the hole altogether. So that one bothers me. There's also a big hole at the edge here, at the bottom edge. Very, very big to be reweaving thread by thread. And then right at this side, the binding has been eaten away with this woven pattern in it and some of the edge of the fabric has gone as well. So that is a problem. This is an angle poise lamp with a magnifying glass in it. It's helping me to see things more easily. And as I start to take this binding off, 
first of all, the first thing I noticed is that this isn't sewn with thread. You know, the seamstress hasn't gone to, you know, Joanne's and bought some thread to match her lovely handwoven wool. She's used a thread of the fabric. So she's used the same fibres that the fabric was woven in, in to sew the binding on. So that is the first interesting thing. The other interesting thing is as I start to take the binding off this corner that's been damaged, I'm seeing the corner of the fabric and you can see where it was either started or finished off. You can see where the threads have been tied at the corner where this piece was woven. So I am already learning a lot and I'm starting to wonder if I can take threads off the edge without unravelling things because this is a complete woven piece of wool. You know, it's complete and finished at the edges, so the binding is just there to add resilience and strength, but I think the edges of the fabric are already, you know, woven in and finished. So taking something out might be tricky. Well, it's kind of now March. I've been procrastinating over this royally because this started out as a simple mending project and as so often happens, it's turned into so much more. I'm out of my comfort zone, I'm just gonna admit it. I was going to find some threads in the edge, but it really looks like the weave is too loose and I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess with it. So I needed to find something to do the reweaving with to sort of weave this fabric back together that is appropriate and matches. Now I looked up Peruvian wool. There is such a thing as Peruvian wool. It tends though to be random wools for us to knit with. So random chunky pink yarn rather than something suitable for something like this. And all of the sources of Peruvian wool I found, none of them seem to be sort of fair trade. A friend suggested to me that I try a company called Jameson's in the Shetland Islands in the north of Scotland. I was able to send them a little fragment of one of these pieces of yarn from the edge of one of the breaks, the holes, and they were able to match it. So this is hand spun yarn of just about the right weight. They've sent me these two balls of wool, Shetland Spindrift and Ultra, and they are very fine two-ply yarns. So to compare to the yarn from the poncho itself, it's a pretty good match. And there's the other colour. You see, that's the original poncho in the middle and these are the two. So they reckon these were the two closest. So I think by using a mixture of the two, I can just about approximate the original garment. Seabolt observed in her study two categories of ponchos. The palais, that is a more colorful one, and a plain brown poncho, or poncho pardo. The brown poncho, or poncho pardo, is a genetic garment of the contemporary Andean campesino. It no longer identifies the ethnic community, but instead identifies the wearer as a peasant farmer and a member of the state's market economy. Men would wear it while working on the fields and when they go to the market. The brown poncho marks the upwardly mobile peasant farmer and reflects his class, economic status, and worldview. All right, I have done this first little mend, and it's not perfect, but it's not bad. I am surprisingly pleased with that. You can see an extreme close-up there, but, you know, when you pull back a bit, it's not bad at all. It is now August, friends. <laughs> this has become one of those projects that I procrastinated over because they're just it was kind of intimidating. I went into this thinking I knew 
it was going to be, yeah, simple mending project, right? And then you get into it and realise how complex and time-consuming it's going to be. And kind of came home to me the responsibility I have to do this right. Over the last few months, after moving house and coming here, I worked on one little hole here, and that went fairly well. Small win. And then moved on again to this much bigger hole. And I've completed now one big hole. I've mended one big hole and I'm feeling confident again. I feel more confident turning the cameras back on and we'll go to this second big hole. Now I'll be able to much more confidently show you what I'm doing, show you what I've learned and we'll do the second one together. All of this involves just being really, really careful. And as you see, as I take this binding off, I'm left with enough of the woven fabric here that I'll be able to weave into it at the edges. I need to weave in a little way into the intact fabric to hold it steady. So now I've got the edge of the binding taken off, so I've got a little bit of fabric here to weave into because I need enough around the edge of intact fabric to hold the new fabric steady. And I've got the whole thing pinned to my sleeve board, so it's pinned to a solid base to keep it in shape. Not stretched, but kind of pulled taut, but not putting any strain on it, if you sort of see what I mean, and kept just in shape so that we can now work with this We've got another big hole here, much like the one that I fixed before up here, except this one has got added complexity. This one has got a tear at the top. So I think what I have to try and do is I have to fix that tear and then fix this hole. But one of the things I've learned doing one of these big holes, I was very nervous about doing this because it told you, the instructions told you, if you've got a little hole, and yes, weave it back together, put new threads in. But if you've got a big hole, you need to find an extra bit of fabric from the edge of the garment or the hem or whatever, and use that and use a patch and weave it in around the edge rather than weaving the whole hole back together with completely new threads. I didn't have any extra fabric, so I needed to reweave over this enormous hole with individual yarns, individual pieces of yarn. I didn't know whether it would work. It did work in the end, but I found I needed to do it a slightly different way from the way that instructions in Threads magazine recommended. They said when you're doing a small hole, you start with weaving threads across the middle in both directions and work outwards. I found that didn't work as well, particularly with this fabric. It's very easy to see when you look very closely that the warp is quite different from the weft. The threads going one way are different from the threads going the other way. It's quite easy to see how the warp threads have been stretched on the loom and then the weft threads have been woven in. And so what I needed to do was sort of try and recreate that by putting in all the threads one way first and then weaving in the other direction. So I'm sort of recreating process that the weavers used. In order to do that, I think I've kind of got to do the hole and that tear at the same time because I've got to weave all these threads this way and then weave all the threads the other way. And I also discovered with these two slightly different shades of yarn, one goes one way, the other goes the other way because as I look very closely at these yarns, I think there is one colour going in one direction and another colour going in the other direction that makes this very unique shade of brown. So I am going to start working up and down. I'm probably going to work down into this edge and then do as the weavers have done again. I've got an edge here where these threads would have perhaps gone down this way and then back up the other way. I don't know. We'll see. I'll have a go.
I'm going to end up cutting these little floating bits off because they're just, I just found in the end they were more of a hindrance than a help. important to go back in here at the right point so I'm looking at where this thread next to mine comes down and making sure I go back in here somewhere. So there's the first thread and these will all have to go because they're in the way. going in and out, following the path of the original threads and taking it well into the intact fabric. able to identify if this poncho has any sort of religious identity. It is possible that it got labeled as shamanic because of tourists and with that it creates yet another level of identity. Seabold describes in her research that the weavings are sold to a middleman who market them for the tourist grade. The community then becomes indigenous as the frame of reference changes to the state and even international perspective. Community members are aware of the multiple layers of identity available to them as just as they speak in different voices, so too do the textiles that they weave and the fashions that they choose to wear. done here. I've come all the way up from the bottom, one thread at a time, and I'm just into this last little section now. This is where the tear was at the top of this hole, so I've just got a few more threads fill in there. is almost done. So we've got two big holes filled and looking good and they don't look quite like the original fabric. At a distance it's mended. When you look closely you can tell where the holes were but I kind of like that because it retains some integrity. You can see what's original and what isn't when you look closely. I like that. So there's just one more part to fix and that is one hole that is right on this edge.
the Met Museum has an excellent extant of the 18th century, very similar to this one. It's similar in colors, but it has more stripes. The poncho that they have seems to have a different construction, but it is also of parado color with graying stripes. And it's a great example of how these women weave them because they maintain their tradition, but yet adding little touches of their own expression of how they see their heritage, their tradition, and their art. I am leaving in two days on the trip where I'm going to take this back to its owner. Fortunately, we are nearly there. All of the three big holes are now fixed. I didn't have to take anything off, cut anything away, change anything. It's going to look as it would have done when it was new, kind of, in the sense that you can just see where the holes were. So one here, one here, one here. And the last one I've just finished on this edge is looking good. It was very hard to keep that edge straight. It just wasn't going to be perfectly straight all along the edge when it was finished. But I'm going to be able to live with that because it has binding that has to go all the way around the edge. So all I have left to do now is where this second hole was near the edge. I've just got to sew the binding back on and that's easy enough to do. I've kind of figured out what the stitch was that the original artisan used. So I'm going to use as much as I can of the yarn that was sewn in originally and just sew that back on. And then this one is slightly more tricky because on this side, because it was munched right at the edge, the binding was munched through. So we need to do something clever there. So where the binding meets on the other side, it overlaps quite a long way from here to here. And that gives me enough to work with. So what I'm going to do is take that piece of binding off, finish off the edge and use this bit to fill in where I have to take out that bit that's been munched. So we're almost there. And I may have to do a little bit of this when I arrive, but we will see. I also have to pack a suitcase. So here we are in Colorado. We're nearly done. I'm seeing Tom in three days. I've just got one tricky bit left to do. All of the holes are fixed. The last tricky thing is this place here where the binding was eaten.
In the same way that the Scottish people descent may not wear the kilt every day, the Indian Highlanders, such as Ayamada and Keshwa have a history of struggle and adaption. And as reported by Rebecca Church in the early days after the Spanish conquest, there was a definitive distinction between the European people and the indigenous people from Peru. As time passed, and more and more people began to interbreed, the distinction became blurred. While it's true that some individuals may still wear their traditional dress every day, it may also be possible that they only wear that in festivities or special occasions. So in that sense, this poncho could have shamanic identity if the person that owns it wears it during their religious practice because the identity is given not only by the people that produce the garment but also by the people that wears it so we would need a little bit more research into that remains is to return this poncho to its owner. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. So I've got something for you. After a year, I finally finished this project and it has been a labour of love. Throughout the whole of this video, I haven't actually explained what it is you do. So would you like to... Yeah, I would. We're actually in a, in a massive valley, a huge corridor of ancient tribal energy that's about 100 miles long, east to west, and about 30 miles wide, north to south and we're somewhere right in the middle of it. This fire circle is right in the middle of it. And we have several sacred sites around us, Chimney Rock, Chaco Canyon, Mesa Verde, and then all the mountain ruins to the north of us. I've been working in this space for nearly 15 years. So it was just a spot on the ground. I would make fire on the ground, come out here and sit quietly and listen. And, and how that began was one of our, my dearest friends came to live with us. He was terminally ill, so we took care of him the last 18 months of his life and he passed away. And while I was watching, you know, taking care of him, my wife and I and our children, watching him withdraw from life, 
catalyzed something in me that was completely unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I started going to the woods early in the morning before sunrise and in the evening at sunset and often staying out all night. And I'd sleep on the ground and I started making fire. Gradually, and at the same time, not so gradually, a voice, I started to hear a, my authentic voice come to me. It was very clear and distinct. It was my voice, but not my voice. Mm -hmm. And it's been with me ever since. It was probably with me before. I just didn't recognize it. And then this ceremony came through me a little bit at a time. And I began building altars. So I created altars all over the land. So it became my practice to come to the woods, make fire, lay out an altar, and let this ceremony come through me and let my voice speak to me. You know, quite frankly, it's changed my life. Mm. My friend's passing, it, it wasn't for me, why did he die and, I, and I'm living, but what happened for me is I wanted to live and I wanted to know why I'm here. I wanted to know who I am and why I'm here and who sent me. And so those became the, the three driving questions that lived, they seemed to live here at the fire. I would, I would find them here, I would, I would engage them here. You know, I was a chiropractor for 30 years and retired from my practice almost four years ago to devote myself to what I do now, which is bring others to the fire, singly and in groups. And I work with all kinds of different groups, school faculties, healthcare professionals, creative groups, entrepreneurs, professionals, housewives, massage therapists, and people finding their way. Essentially, that's, that's what I do is I help people to find their way and to remember who they are. Not because I tell them, but because I create sacred space for them inside of which they can discover that for themselves. Yeah. It's deep work, it's, it's the hardest work and the most joyous work I've ever been engaged in. Yeah, and it's not when you say sacred, it's not a religious thing, it's kind of a universal thing. It's universal, it? yeah, I always say there's no religion here at the fire. Mm. All faiths are welcome, mm -hmm. all faiths that come in peace and come in love. This is a level playing field yeah. for all of us. So it doesn't matter who you are out in the world. When you come here, we're all the same. We're all one. And we leave our egos at the outside the circle. And inside we create, we co-create together a safe space to tell the truth yeah. about how it's been and what we're up against and to shatter the illusion that we're anything less than who we truly are. Yeah. Yeah, I say find your own way. Yeah. Know, know your way. And I'm just someone who's been down the path away yeah. and traversed the ground and, and gone to those dark places and come up against the hard stuff and, and really searched my own soul, my own life, and facilitate a conversation that helps people yeah. to discover that for themselves. I learned so much from you. I really do. You've been an inspiration to me as a friend and as a teacher. And it Thank you. just means the world. So, this is a poncho that lived up here at the fire, and then you brought it out the first time I came up here. And there are rats up here, and they'd eaten big holes in it. And as far it. as you were concerned, it was just, ah, this is ruined. This is so special, because this was a gift, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And yes. it came from Peru. It's a Peruvian shaman's poncho, and it was gifted to me. And it's been in every ceremony yeah. that I've ever done. It's always present. So I've missed it for a year. Yeah. I'm sorry it took so long. <laughs> this has been a really, a real labor of love to do this with respect and reverence and try to bring it back to, well, not to add too much of myself into it, but to try to restore it to what it was and fix it so that it can be whole and can be used again. So and it oh, was a pleasure to do Thank you so much. So this is yours. Thank you. <laughs> oh my, you can't even tell. Now I can bring it's it worse. back. No, you can, no, you can use it again. Yeah. I am <laughs> deeply grateful. It's been a privilege and it's been an honor to have you here and to do the deep work of recovering the memory of who you are. It's certainly been a privilege and an honor for me to be here. So if you would like to learn more about Tom and his work, he has a mailing list, just like I do. And there is a link in the description below here to find out more.
And huge thanks to Aranzu Kelly for sharing her research so generously. You can also find her details in the description below. Yeah.